hope is alive in me for all the world to see that you are good. Let's stand to sing together. Come on. I was buried beneath my shame. Who can carry that kind of weight? 
It was my turn yeah. Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried Called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into
to dance When death was arrested say amen. Come on. Great stuff, guys. Y'all have a seat. You guys know my name's Jeremy Abel. I'm the, one of the associate pastors here at, uh, at Clear Branch. We're so grateful to have you with us this morning. Whether you're joining us for the first time or you're here for your thousandth time, we could not be happier to have you here. And not only are we happy to have our, our folks who are just kind of visiting for their first time, we're also happy to have a great group back with us for the start of their new season. Pinson Valley High School's football team. Now, I know, I know y'all are used to clapping for the football team. We've got another awesome team here today, too. We've actually got the volleyball team with us as well. 
And they are getting ready to start their season on the 27th for the volleyball team. Of course, the football team started Friday night, and they have another great game this week. And a lot of us were there to cheer them on this past week, and we'll continue to walk with them through this season. Uh, you guys know it's always a special morning when we have these young men and their coaches and their families with us. So if you get the opportunity before you take off after the service, make sure you come by and say hello to these young men. Tell them how much you love them, how much you appreciate them, and, and they certainly know that you're there for them. We, we do that in so many ways at the school, right? Through, through the sandwich program that we do and through our support at events and uh, through Crosshaven, which meets here at the, the school on Sunday nights. In fact, if you guys are interested and you're a normal attendee here at Clear Branch, you want to come check out Crosshaven tonight. We're doing a night of worship and prayer over the school and the community, and we're going to follow that up with Sundays, so ice cream. It's called Worship Sunday, spelled with an A-E. You guys come check it out at, uh, at Crosshaven tonight at 5 o'clock. We're going to have some great worship with Micah and the praise band there, and we'll also have a great time of prayer and then some awesome, awesome ice cream. So don't pass that up if you got the chance. Now, you guys know at this point it's time to look at those pads and baskets that are in the center of the aisles. Grab those, record your attendance. You can place your tithe and your offering inside the basket, as always. Don't forget, you can also give via PushPay, which is an online program. There's countless ways for you to do that, and we certainly appreciate that. And all that goes into these baskets and all that goes into PushPay each week is what allows us to continue to do ministry, not only here and in Pinson Valley, but around the world. So we're so grateful for that. Let's go to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a God that loves us and a God that calls us into ministry and then a God that gives us opportunity and that blesses us as we seek to go out and inform and help to be part of the transformation of this world. We love that we have the opportunity to share of your goodness and your grace and your love. And we can't thank you enough for all that you offer. We can't thank you enough for the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus that allows us to be made whole and complete. And so, Father, we ask that you take those things that are given in this moment, those things that are given throughout the week and throughout the month, and that you would multiply those, not for our glory, but for your glory, so that we can continue to do all that we're able to, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus in this place, in Pinson, and around this city and this county and all over the world. Thank you for being a great God, and thank you for entrusting us with his blessings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. These altars are open, but before we do that, we're going to pray over the high school. So if you guys want to come forward, y'all mind coming up for a minute? We're going to pray over all the students. So if you're an athlete, you're a coach, you're part of the administration, if you're here with us, come forward. Uh, we're going to lift our hands. Uh, and so as, as we're getting ready to do this, what we normally do, if you are in the audience, rather than like having you guys crowd them, will you just put a hand up in the air? And, and as I pray, you guys can pray along with me over this awesome team, two teams, and their coaches. By the way, make it. By the way, make it out to a game this uh, this season for sure. Try to make it to all of them. If you make them to more than me, mm, make it to more than me. I'll buy you dinner. How there you like you that? Go. There you go. That might be a big problem, Jeremy. Jenny's yeah. like, no, Jeremy, don't say that. No, um, I'm kidding. We'd love to see you. But uh, let's go to God in prayer. Let's lift those hands over this team and the school and their faculty. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these young men and these young women, and we thank you for the, the coaches and the teachers that are dedicated to all that they can be for these young people, to teach and to lead and to guide. Father, we pray that you'd provide them with seasons that of protection, that you'd give them an opportunity to, to be your hands and your feet and to be your mouthpieces in a school that's full of young people that also need to know more about who you are and what you call us to. We pray, Lord, that you would give them an opportunity to know their identity in you, not simply their identity as athletes. And that as you bless them and give them those, those places where they can speak into and live into lives, that you would allow them to be representatives for you in this community and in the school. As we pray for that protection, we ask that you'd keep them from injury this season. We ask you that you would help them in the midst of whatever they may face to know that you are God. And that's not a God that's abstract or a God that's distant. It's a God that longs to be in relationship with them. And so, Father, we just pray that you would make your presence known among these young people, that you'd make your presence palpable in this school, and that you would transform this community by way of your work in and through them. Yes. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys, go and be seated again. Come and say hey to these folks. Before you get out of here today, we want to see that. So at the close of...
the close of worship today, I'm going to invite the athletes and coaches. We're so delighted to have football and volleyball teams with us today. And each season, we get the opportunity to level on a new group of athletes in the fall and the winter and the spring seasons there at the school and over summer as well. And uh, I love the partnership we're in. And last, last year, well, I'll talk about it in the message today, but I was blown away to be at the state championship watching them bring home a second year in a row as state champs in that as well. Amen. Some of these same athletes were the ones that are part of the state championship in basketball for the first time last year, too. Amen. Huh? <laughs> cool, it said, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> That's great. Uh, let me just tell you, we've got a really special opportunity. There are only two sacraments in the church. The first is the sacrament of baptism we celebrated last week. And every, every opportunity we have to see a person who commits their lives to Christ and makes that public profession of faith. I'm pointing over here. That's where the baptismal pool normally is on those Sundays. It's such a special moment where that life is being claimed by God, where that person is making their profession of faith to the world, saying, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm so grateful for the privilege to celebrate the sacrament of uh, baptism every month, but also every month we celebrate the sacrament of communion. Baptism is something we do once in a lifetime, but communion we're called to do as often as we can. I just want to remind you that on the night in which Christ offered himself for, up for us, he gathered with those disciples, these, these guys that he'd been walking with for three years in his public ministry at this point. And they were scared, they were nervous, they were anxious because he had told them three times, I'm not going to be with you much longer. And they were so afraid about of those words. Jesus, it's not, we want to stay together. We need to stay together as a team. This is important. We're doing good things. Well, how could you possibly consider leaving us? And in that moment, Jesus, with an anxious group of disciples, he took simple, ordinary bread. Bread that he, they had seen him do amazing things with. Bread that he had taken a little boy's lunch and blessed it and multiplied it and used it to feed 5,000 on one occasion, 3,000 on another and gathered up enough broken pieces that there were 12 basketfuls left over at the one meal and seven basketfuls left at the other meal. Both times the, the leftovers were more than enough to feed all the tribes of Israel and all the nations known around the world. But this night was different. They had heard him talk about bread and they'd, they'd share Passover with him three times but this night Jesus took the bread he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said this is my body my body that was whole and it will be broken so that you who are broken can be made whole this is my body and it's more than enough for you eat of it all of you and in the same way, when the meal was over, Jesus took a cup. And they expected him because for more than a thousand years, they had celebrated the Passover meal at this point. And, and Jesus had with them celebrated the Passover meal many times. And as they took the blood, they would have been reminded that they took blood at, at, the, at the Passover lamb. And they put it over the doorpost to protect the people from the, the loss of the firstborns. And it was this blood that would cover the Israelite, God's people, and it would set them apart so that they could be carried out and toward the promised land. But this night was different because on this night Jesus took the cup and he lifted it and he blessed it and he raised it to the father and he said this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins drink of it all of you and do this in remembrance of me he was saying, this may have been a Passover lamb's blood for all these years, for centuries at this point. But tonight, friends, this is a reminder of my blood that's about to be poured out for you. Now, I want you to remember who's at the table. You've got doubting Thomas. You've got denying Peter. You've got... James and John who are still arguing about who's the most important, who's going to get the starting role, who's going to be the starring top billing on the marquee. And Jesus said to them, drink of it, all of you. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and juice.
that they would be for us the body and the blood of Jesus and that we would be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. God, that we would be not just remembering what you did at this meal some 2,000 years ago, but we would be remembering that we would be a remembrance. God, that literally our presence in others' lives would remind them of the living Christ. That, that our sacrifices would remind others of the, the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us. So as we come to this table today, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to receive your body and your blood and in very real ways become it as well. As we become a part of the body of Christ that's been redeemed by that blood. Make us one together. Make us one in ministry to all the world until Jesus, until you come home and take us home. Have your way in this place this day. And all God's people said, amen. As those who will serve come forward. Now, let me just give a few pieces of direction here. The first is this. This is not an invitation from Vaughn Stafford, the preacher. It's not an invitation from Clear Branch of the Church. It's not an invitation from the Methodist Church. This is an invitation from a humble carpenter of Nazareth who said, Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This morning as the table is prepared and the elements have been blessed, this invitation is open to all. You don't have to go to this church. You don't have to be a part of this denomination. This is an invitation from Jesus who says, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. The second is, as you come, there'll be two people in front of each of the sections around this room. The first will break off a piece of the bread. They'll hand it to you and they'll say, this is the body of Christ given for you. And then you'll take that piece of bread and you'll move to the next station, the next place where they hold the cup. And you'll take that piece of bread and you'll dip it into the cup. And then you'll receive. And they'll say, this is the blood of Christ which was shed for you. Literally, the whole body that was broken so we who are broken could be made whole. The whole cup that was full yet was emptied in Jesus so that we who are empty could be filled with his love. Today as we come, I invite you to receive and to consider what Jesus has done for you. And then after you receive, we invite you to come and fill these altars. To fill these altars and maybe you bring the broken places in your life and say, God, I need you so desperately, I need you. Or maybe you come and you just want to celebrate and say, God, I thank you for what you've done in me and what you've yet to do through me. Whichever place you come, from a place being full or empty, being excited or broken, Jesus meets you here. So today, come and receive the body and the blood of Christ. I invite you to stand, to receive, and to pray.
so, so grateful for a time to come and proclaim your goodness and your greatness. That's for you. Lord, I ask that as we continue through service today, that you'd open up our eyes to see you and our ears to experience you. Open up our hearts to feel your love. And we'll give you the praise. It's in your name that all God's people said. Amen. Y'all take a seat. You got me, Pete? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Is it coming up a little bit? One, two, one, two. There we go. We're just going to go ahead and get this all right here. So every good Jewish boy, (laughs) from a very young and early age, would have learned the most important prayer in his life. At the beginning and ending of each day, at the beginning of morning and evening prayers, every good Jewish boy since 200 years before the birth of Christ would have gone to temple and heard this call and this prayer in Hebrew. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Boruch Shem Kavod, Malchuto Le'olam Vo'ed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his glorious name, his kingdom is forever and ever. B'Shem Yeshua, in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You want to just give thanks for that this morning? What a special privilege to have with us Pastor, Rabbi, Sammy Rubin. So grateful for his friendship and partnership in the gospel here at Clear Branch. When I met Sammy, I was uh, touched by Sammy and Donna's uh, faith in Christ. And Sammy was born as a Jewish boy into a Jewish family. And Sammy uh, became a follower of Jesus many years ago, which makes him a Messianic Jew. And so as a little boy, literally from, from 200 B.C., they had been praying. As soon as you were of age, the first sentence of your life that you would have memorized was, Hear, O Israel. The Lord your God is one, the one true God, the monotheistic faith that we follow. And in this moment, it was so incredible that they would have gone to temple, begun every morning and every evening with that prayer. They would have added to that coming out of Deuteronomy 5 or 6, four, verses 4 through 8. And he just read the first one of those verses that would have gone on to say, uh, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. It was incredible prayer that reminded daily um, they, they would have had the, the talid, the prayer shawl that he had over his head. They would have prayed through all the various laws in that as well. They would have had a, a teflon or a phylactery that would have been on their arm. And it would have, they would have called it the, the yod and the rosh on the hand and the, and, and that was connected to the heart. And on the head that was connected to the mind. It was a reminder to hold God's word in our hearts and our minds and our strength. They would have been taught that from the earliest of age. And today, 
as we read this scripture, Jesus has been questioned by a scribe. It's the only positive interaction Jesus has in the entire Bible with a scribe. Usually the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees were the ones that Jesus was in, in arguments with and conflicted with. And, but this is the only encounter Jesus has here in Mark's gospel in the 12th chapter. And we're going to pick up on verse 28 through 34. And I'm going to invite you to stand out of reverence for God's most precious and holy word. If you would stand. I'm going to read the scripture and it'll be on the screen. And after reading the scripture, I'm going to say to you, this is the word of God for the people of God. And you'll respond. But when I do it in a second, it's going to be even louder. Maybe twice, three times that loud. Hear the word of God. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he, being Jesus, answered them well, asked, Which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, The most important of all is hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is like it. The, the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said he is one. And there is no other besides him. And to love him with all heart and with all understanding and with all strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Ooh, that's good. You may be seated. Incredible encounter Jesus is having here with a scribe, with a Pharisee, with a religious ruler, with one who knows the laws forwards and backwards. Now, I want to make sure you understand here, this, this religious leader, this lawyer of the, of the scriptures had seen the incredible discussion Jesus was having right before this with the Sadducees. And when Jesus answered wisely about resurrection, I don't have time to get into that particular passage there, but when he answers wisely about resurrection and clears that up for the Sadducees, and this Pharisee, this scribe, sees Jesus' answer and is impressed, and he decides, well, if this guy knows that answer, I want to ask him this question, which really was the most important question that these scribes came to temple every day to ask. Here in Jerusalem, they gathered and they would kind of impress each other with who knew the law better. Now, to say knowing the law was significant is just a huge understatement. Traditionally, scribes and those teachers of the law spoke about the 613 Mosaic laws that were contained in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the second through fifth books of the Bible. They knew these laws forwards and backwards. They recited them all day, every day. They put them in different groupings and sections, and they talked about moral law and relational law and sacrificial law and Levitical law, and they, they understood the laws. Let me just be clear about that. But what they were trying to do is to, to say all the laws in as few of words as possible. To get the gist of what Jesus is saying here, let me put it this way. There were, these 613 laws were divided into 365 negative laws and 248 positive laws. It was common practice for them to, to come together and to debate on which of these was actually the most important of all. They would argue about which is the weightiest and which is the lightest, which is the most significant and which is secondary or consumed, absorbed into others. And I want you to think about it this way. You who are in married relationships, if you were to come to me for uh, marital counseling and, and like one of you just had a whole bunch of stuff they needed to say about the other, he doesn't ever or she doesn't ever or the, you know, whatever, you went into this long diatribe, five, ten minutes, you went on and on and on about how bad they are, how they don't serve you or care for you or honor you or live out their vows or better, worse, richer, poor, sickness, health. It, it, after all of that just blah, came out, I might say to you this. What's the most important thing of all you've just said that you want them to hear? Because that's a lot of stuff you just said. What's the most important thing that they've got to hear you say in this moment? 
Or hypothetically, students in the room, let me just come meddle in your business here for a minute. Let's say school's starting, say, Tuesday, hypothetically here. And, um, and you've got all your summer reading you were supposed to have done. And you realize later this coming week there's going to be a test on the Tale of Two Cities or the Great Gatsby or the Scarlet Pimpernel, whatever the book is that you're supposed to have read over the summer. And that's, that's coming and you're stressed out about it. And you realize right now, oh crud, I forgot all about summer reading. <laughs> that's not going to go well. So you think to yourself, I better go get some spark notes or some cliff notes or something so that I can get the gist of the whole of the book, the main plot, the main characters, the sub-themes. That's what they're asking Jesus in this moment. What is the most important of all the laws? And Jesus took the conversation from lighter and heavier and he, he flipped it on end and he asked, he had actually answered in a way that tied this answer together better than anyone had ever heard before. When he answered the scribe's question, I believe the name of the sermon today is three greats of a great church. A great gathering of the body of Christ. A great gathering of the people of God. We just shared communion and we talked about we receive his body and blood to become his body redeemed by his blood. The, the, the Christ is the body of believers. It's the body of those who make up that church. And I believe the first of those great, first of those three greats is this. It's a great commitment is your first blank. A great commitment to God. Here again, Mark 12, 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And it's coming straight out of the Shema that, that uh, Rabbi Reuben just shared with us. And it's straight out of there. And Pastor Reuben, as he shared, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. This part of Jesus' answer, let's just be clear, it's so total but it's also so common to his hearers. As they gathered at temple, they, they would have all been nodding like, well, yeah, uh, duh, uh, I get it. Of course, we say this every morning. We say it every night. We know this. If you, if you come out of Mark's gospel or Matthew's gospel or Luke's gospel, you'll hear love with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's mentioned it, over and over in, in each of the different gospels. And the order changes up a little bit. But here's the gist of it. Here's what matters most in that is to love God. What, what comes before heart, soul, mind, and strength? Every time it says, love with all your. God's never been interested in some of your. He's never been interested in part of your. He's always been interested in all your heart. All your mind. All your strength. All your soul. All your heart, that which desires. All your soul, that which feels. All your mind, that which, re which reflects. All your strength, that which expresses will. It's kind of like doing a flip off the high dive at the, at the pool. And you get up on that high dive. The worst thing you can do is do three-fourths of a full flip off the high dive. It's going to hurt. You better go all the way or don't go any of the way. Because what God wants is all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. One of Wesley's... Great quotes, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, said, Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and to desire nothing but God. Such alone will set up the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. I want to invite Coach Nix to come on up. And uh, a couple questions I, I, I really want to hear his answer to that I think that separates a good team and a great team. A good player and a great player. And so, Coach, uh, first of all, you just want to give a warm, clear branch welcome to Coach Nix. Coach, one of, the, one of the things as a, as a former athlete in a former life, I don't look like it anymore, but as a has-been, I always say it's better to be a has-been than it ever was. And, um, so, but one of the questions that I really believe separates a good athlete and a great athlete has to do with commitment. And so in your experience as a coach, arguably one of the best coaches in the nation, uh, the GOAT of high school football, um, what, what separates, what, what role does commitment play in taking players to that highest level, athletes to that highest level? Uh, I think that, that most of us know in any profession, if, if you want to be great, um, you have to be committed to it. It's like you said about jumping, when you get on that, 
diving boards, you better be fully committed mm -hmm. um, when you jump of what you're going to do or it's not going to go good. It's the same way with, with athletics. It's the same way with business. It's the same way, you know, when a doctor walks into an, uh, a surgery room, he doesn't walk in and say, ah, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that. No, he walks in committed to getting it done, whatever the job is. And so it's no different in athletics um, that, that you have to be fully committed to what you're doing, fully committed to, to working out during the offseason, fully committed to learning what you need to learn, fully committed to being a great teammate, fully committed, you know, it, it, it doesn't work if you show up on this Friday night, the next Friday night, I might be there, I might not, coach, i got to work or I've got to do that. Um, you're not going to go very far as a team and you're not going to go very far as an athlete, um, whether it be in, you know, in volleyball, football, doesn't matter what it is. Um, it takes full commitment, like you said, it's not just part, it is full. Um, and, and that's, we've been very fortunate that we have had a lot of, players and coaches and administration and, and a lot of other people that have been fully committed to what we've done, which has given us a lot of success. Amen. I was amazed when I showed up at the game Friday night and uh, Jeremy is there all the time. He sees the athletes in all the different seasons and watches them develop physically and emotionally and relationally and their uh, sports IQ in that. Uh, but I was shocked when I saw some of these boys that I saw last year uh, at the end of the season and saw them at Friday night. I was like, holy cow. It's amazing what peanut butters and chocolate milk do. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, that caloric intake has paid off. It's amazing. So, Coach, what, what, does, it, what does it mean to you uh, as, as coach of football? And I could ask the volleyball coach here today as well and others. What does it mean to know that as a church body, we're committed to standing with you, the coaches, and the athletes, and the families, and helping to develop and raise these athletes up. Well, you know, it makes me think of James, too. And I've, I've spent a lot of time this summer in James. In James, too, it talks about, um, you know, if you hear somebody that they're in, you know, they're cold or they're hungry, and you tell them, well, you know, go get warm, be well fed, peace be with you, what, what good is that? You know, what good is it to talk and, and say it without doing it? Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of people say a lot of things, um, but they very rarely do it. Um, but I just I want to real quickly, any of our athletes and coaches, if you have had a glass of chocolate milk, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, an orange, an apple, beef jerky, trail mix, um, cheese, uh, what else am I missing, guys? <laughs> Tights, uh, cold gear. If, you have, if you've partaken in any of that, y'all stand up real quick. And we have a, a, a lot that aren't here. Y'all go ahead and sit down. We have a lot that aren't here that obviously are the same. We, have, we don't have a player in our program, a player in our school, um, really male or female, um, that hasn't benefited from what you've done. Um, and, and you can't even begin to understand um, how far that goes for us as coaches when we try to, say, share the gospel. Um, you know, we can take those F FCA Bibles that, that Clear Branches has generously provided to us, and we can give it to them and put them in hand. Um, but seeing the love that, that Miss Rita and Mr. Joel demonstrate almost every day, Miss Rita is at our building, um, it's amazing. And the guys know when they see her, get the buggies because we got a lot of food out there in the back of her car. Um, and so it's just amazing the commitment level um, that you've given us as coaches to now be able to not only feed their stomachs, but feed their souls um, because you've made them very tender to that. And I don't want you to miss that. I don't want you to miss... Uh, the fact that well, I guess I guess it was now three or four weeks ago that we went to First Baptist Asheville to a little uh, Night of Champions deal. We had 17 of our young our young men uh, make some type of commitment to Christ, um, and now that gives us an Amen. opportunity to follow up um, with that. But I just I want you to know from us um, the commitment that you have not only in giving us food and, and things that we need, but your prayer. Um, it is so coveted, and we just I just ask you, um, you know, that you will just continue on the war with us, continue on the battle, because it is a battle every day. Satan mm -hmm. absolutely does not like what's going on at Pinson Valley High School, That's right. um, and it's a constant battle. Uh, but I just I, I pray that we will continue to battle together through prayer and through also the faith that y'all have shown through the actions that you've shown, and we're very thankful for that um, to the leadership of this church. Um, but also to the members of this church. So thank you very much from Pinson Valley High School, from all of our students there. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you, Coach. Now I've got to keep preaching somehow. When it comes to loving God, let's just be really clear. Scripture is so obvious about this, and, and 
Coach Nix has just touched on this. When it comes to loving God, we're not merely to love him with our words. Friends, there are lots of people that love God with words. There are lots of people who say, be warm, be well fed, hope things work out for you, bless your heart, whatever. There are lots of people that speak a word. But this is what 1 John 3, 18 says, says, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Friends, what, what we're doing in partnership with these incredible athletes and the, their families and the, the students in the school is incredible ways of, of moving our words from being simply lip service to being in the service of God's people. The commitment to love God is to be done intensely, constantly, and above all things. In, in this, we have what we have leads naturally here in loving God with everything we are, everything we have. When we do that naturally, it leads to the second part of the same commandment that Jesus gives the answer to. And this is the second great of a great church, a great body of believers. It's not only a great commitment, it's a great commitment unto something else. And that is the great commandment. The great commandment in ministry. Here again, God's word, Mark 12, 31. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus is, is taking Leviticus 19, 18, the next verse on your page there. And he's, he's basically saying, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the, your sons or your own people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. In the Gospels, Jesus goes past just the neighbor that's like yourself. He goes to all people are your neighbor. 1 John 4, 19 and 21 says it this way, that we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must, not can, not might, not should, or give it a consideration, no, must also love his brother and sister, I would add. You see, when, when Jesus gives this answer and he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he takes what they already knew. And they knew this so well. As soon as Jesus broke into the Shema and his answer, all the Jewish people, they went, mm-hmm, sure. But when he tied that together and he said, and the second is like it, they all leaned in and said, oh, oh, there's never been a second. What are you talking about, second? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, not only does he take all 613 of those laws, those Mosaic laws, and put them on these two statements. But he takes the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments and he puts them on these two statements as well. Think about it. One cannot love God in isolation from others. That's the point of Jesus in this moment. You can't just love God and give it lip service and vertically, I'm loving God. No, loving God should always have outstretched arms that love neighbor as self. If, if all your, your love is just vertical in love of God and it's never going horizontal in love of neighbor, then you're missing the cross of Jesus. You're missing the reason Jesus came to the world. He already was in love with his father. The father loved the son. But he came and put on flesh and walked among us so he could show that the father and the son love us too. Us that don't look like, act like, talk like him all the time. Us that don't think like or respond like he does all the time. Think, think about it. Part one, love God with everything in the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. The first four, no gods before me, no idols of other gods. Don't take the Lord's name in vain and keep my day, the Sabbath day, the seventh day of creation holy, set apart for my purpose. That's the, that's the love of God, those pieces. But the bigger part of the Ten Commandments, the last six, as a matter of fact, of the Ten Commandments, have to do with love of neighbor as self. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. That, I used to love it when the pastor would talk about that one when I was a, a student. When I was a young person, I was unmarried. Cause I thought, well, at least there's one I'm definitely not doing. That's good. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't covet. Jews and Christians, conservatives and liberals may differ greatly in how best to obey God's word. But we agree completely on the basis of our relationship with God and others. And that is plainly stated, love. Love. Now, we, we disagree on how, how best to love. Let's just be clear about that. But we do not disagree on the essence of our call to love. We, we, we agree that we're called to share love 
truth in love, as a matter of fact. I meet people all the time who say, I'm afraid of doing anything because I'm not sure how to follow God's commands and will. They'll ask, how do I make sure I'm not doing, that I'm doing God's will, or at least I'm not doing anything against it? Or how do I know what's most important? Literally in the first century AD, just a, within a hundred years of the, the birth of Christ, Rabbi Hillel, Jewish rabbi, was asked a similar question. And he, he, asked, he was asked whether he could teach the whole Torah while the learner was standing on one leg. I mean, have, have you ever had a stand-up meeting? I love stand-up meetings because you know you're not going to be there long. If we're, if we're all around the boardroom table and we say, all right, tell you what, today this meeting is going to be a stand-up meeting. It's got to be done by the time we're done standing or we've got to sit down. And the meeting's over at that point. No, it, he goes even a step further. But, um, Rabbi Hillel says, can you teach the whole Torah while I stand on one leg? You can't do it that long. Or I can't. Maybe some of these athletes can, but I can't anymore. He was asked to teach that whole Torah, and this is what he said. He said, do not do to your neighbor what is hateful to you. This is the whole Torah, and the rest is commentary. <laughs> That's it. Don't do to your neighbor what you would not have someone do to you. Don't do to your neighbor what is hateful to you. This is the whole Torah, the whole law, all 613 consumed in this one statement. You see, in loving God with all that we have, we, <laughs> and loving others as a way of putting that love into action, it leads us to the final great of the church. This is it. This is the call. If we really love God with everything we are, everything we have, and we love neighbor as self, it will lead us to what Jesus finally gives to as his last words in, the, in Matthew's gospel, as his last words in Mark's gospel, as Jesus gives this final great, and it is the great commission, and it takes us on mission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, or in many versions, the King James, the NASP, and uh, others, and, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It's very clear that those who walk with Jesus lived out their love for others and that their love of Jesus compelled them to follow through on the challenge of Jesus to go into all the world. This ragtag group of disciples, these 11 that are left. Remember, Judas has taken his life at this point as Jesus is giving them this final commission to go into all the world. He, he sent them ahead earlier in Matthew's gospel, just a couple chapters before in Matthew 26, 32. He tells them to go ahead to Galilee and meet him there at the high mountain. There are mountains all over I don't know if it was Mount Beatitude, if it was Mount Carmel, if it was, I mean, there are all kind of mountains around the Galilee. But Jesus says, go to Galilee, go to the high mountain, and they clearly know where that mountain is. Because they go and they meet him there. They hear his, his challenge to go into all the world. And I started asking myself, why did he tell them to go to Galilee? Why didn't he just have them stay there in Jerusalem? Later, he's going to tell them, stay in Jerusalem, wait here, and the Spirit will come upon you and will empower you to be my witnesses. Remember Acts 1-8, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost. Wait there for the Spirit to descend like in Acts 2, and, and tongues of fire come on everyone, and the church takes off growing. No, no, before any of that happens, Jesus tells them, go to Galilee, and I'll meet you there. Why? Why? This is a long journey. This is 100, I mean, this is 100 miles plus to, to go from Jerusalem up to the Galilee to the high mountain, depending on which mountain. And it hit me this week as I was studying. This is why. How, how many of you who are married remember the first place you went with your spouse? Can I see hands? How many of you who are dating? Let me get it down here a little closer here. How many of you who are dating remember the first place you took that cute girl, that hunky guy? Any of you? That's what I'm talking about. Good job, guys. You're going to help yourself. Heck, if you could put pan over and let these guys, their girlfriends, see that they have their hand up, that's good. There's something about going back to where it started. When I go back to Cleveland, Ohio, and drive through the park, when I remember that it was the year that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame opened there that I met my bride, 
There's something about going back to where it all started and that we have to be reminded of from time to time because somewhere along the way life gets complicated and life gets confusing and life gets ugly and life gets messy and, and there's something about going back and touching where it all started. Some of you at lunch today need to see quiz your spouse if they can remember where it all started in your life, okay? Sorry guys if I just messed your day up. Jesus tells them, you go back to Galilee. And in that place, I'm going to remind you that I called you to come and follow me. It was here that James and John and Andrew and Peter and Philip left nets to follow Jesus. It is here in Galilee that Levi got up from a tax collector booth and left the security of a, a, a cush got job. And it's here that he leaves all that behind to follow Jesus. It's in this place that each of them, Nathaniel and Bartholomew, and, and, and all of them, Thomas, Judas, Thaddeus, all of them left what they were doing to follow Jesus. And watch this. This is so good. This is so good. We need to sometimes remember that place where Jesus first called us to come and follow Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Come to me and I will make you not fishers of fish, but fishers of men. No, Jesus takes them there because he's about to tell them these words. Come, follow. Now go tell. Hear me clearly, church. Go. It, it, God, good, and gospel. None of those words exist if it ain't for the two, first two letters. No, there is no good and there is no gospel if someone doesn't go. If, if, if People can't see God if there is not someone who goes and tells. You're, you're to be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. We're to be Jesus with skin on because you might be the only Jesus someone sees. They went back to Galilee to remember where it all started in their life so that Jesus could say, hey, I called you to come follow me these last three years here, but from here, take it to the end of the earth. Go to the end of the earth and preach and teach and baptize everybody you meet. You see, Jesus was never about maintenance. One of the problems with many of the American churches, and having just come from India, this is not the case in other places. But one of the problems with the American churches, we're too concerned with maintenance. Jesus was not about maintenance. Trustees, forgive me for that. You're to be about maintenance. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus was about mission. Jesus was never about comfortable. He was about commission. When Jesus showed up, they worshiped him, and, and some doubted, sure. You see, Jesus told them to make disciples because a disciple is not just one who's already learned, but one who's always learning. He told them to baptize them as one who's initiating people into the family of God through commitment to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's telling them about teaching them because it's not enough to be made converts to Christ. No, we're to be taught how to be new disciples in Jesus. I love this revelation as I was studying, reading other theologians about these verses. The, the, the commitment to go in Matthew 28, 19 is empowered by the commitment of lo from God in verse 20. Go therefore and make, baptize them and teach them and make disciples of them and lo, I am with you always. In other words, the reason we go is because Jesus has promised to hang low with us. You see, the power and the presence of Jesus are tied to the command and the commission of Jesus. God's power and presence are tied to the gospel message. I, I, I appreciate that we have a beautiful 1,500 seat sanctuary. But let me just promise you, Jesus is not consumed with our seating capacity. He is consumed with our sending capacity. He's not asking how many people just came. He's asking how many people took the message and went with it. And they, they go. Today I have a huge challenge for you. As this sermon comes to a close, I just want to remind you of where we've been in this Sign Here series. That this, today we begin a Say Yes campaign. All you have to do to see the opportunities to say yes to, to be in mission and, and in ministry and on mission with us is, is just type clearbranch.org forward slash yes. 
clearbranch.org forward slash yes. It'll take you straight to the webpage where you can see all the places that you can serve in mission and ministry. The first week of this series, I talked about worship and the importance of engaging in worship. I challenge you to be a, a regular attender, to be one who prays up before you show up, to be a worshiper instead of a judge, and to be an inviter of others to worship. The second week, last week, I got into the story of Moses and Aaron and her as Joshua was down in the battle fighting. I thought about that at the ball game Friday night, watching these athletes out there that are all desperately in need of rest, and many of us who are up in the stands desperately in need of exercise. <laughs> That they're the ones battling down on the field. And we have a call to stand up and, and to, to surround and, and, and provide and support. To be a part of a small group was the challenge last week. To be equipped in small group. To, to come alongside of others and hold their arms up when they're in the battle. And when you're in your battles, to find that they're those that come alongside you and hold your arms up too. Today though. I'm challenging you to find a place to employ your gifts, your heart, your ability, your personality, and your experience in mission and ministry. Find a place to serve inside the church and outside the church. Jesus, after all, said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve every one of us, every single one of us. There's not one person excluded from this has a call to serve, has a call to serve someone else besides ourselves. There's so many wonderful ways you can do this. With children, with students, with worship, with hospitality. You can part, be a part of those ministries in Clear Branch. Or right here at the main campus. You can be a part of that at our Cross Haven service tonight at 5 o'clock. And every night at 5 o'clock. Not every night. Every Sunday night. Sorry, Jeremy. I just committed you to every night there. That every Sunday night at 5 o'clock at Cross Haven. At Pinson Valley High School. We have an opportunity to serve there are tons of life-giving ways you can connect in missions. Today, we're blessed to have with us the beneficiaries of one of my family's favorite um, missions that we do. And that is making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We don't make the cuties. We don't make the string cheese. We don't make the trail mix or the beef jerky. We don't make the, the under uh, gear. But being a part of making those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches is made with great love. I love watching people, catching people making those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We also have an opportunity to sign up to be a Discovery Club volunteer on Wednesday afternoons at Chalkville Elementary. You can volunteer, volunteer to serve meals once a month with the homeless of Birmingham on the second Sunday night of the month. You can join the handyman ministry in helping others and fixing up uh, the, the, the struggles in our community here. You can pick up a Christmas shoebox today. I don't know if they're all gone yet, but I think we only had 40 left when the morning began of the 300 that we had. They've all got to be back next Sunday, though little infomercial there. We have a call to serve. Every one of us does. We can be a part of providing Christmas for children through that that may not have Christmas otherwise. You can sign up to sponsor a child in India. And many of you know the power of that ministry in your own family's lives. You can sign up to go on one of the mission trips today in the lobby. You'll see the tables out there for Kentucky and Peru and India this next summer. Having visited every part of our mission experiences this last year, with the exception of Peru. I, I went to Kentucky, I went to Memphis, Tennessee, and then I went to it, India. It will impact you. It will change you. It will, in some ways, it will destroy you. I'm not the same person I was before I went to India. And whatever is broken or shattered or changed doesn't need to go back to what it was before. As my wife and I stood in the midst of Pinson Valley fans and families last year at Auburn, I can't believe I just said that out loud as an Alabama fan. <laughs> You're welcome, Auburn. When I stood there in the midst of all the fans and all the families and all the crowd of people cheering these athletes on to, to win the state championship last year, it will change you. It will, it will draw your heart into relationship. While I was in India a few weeks ago, I spent time with all the children and many of their families in personal interviews and conversations and a part of me is forever in India. The children are no longer just sponsors. They're no longer just faces on cards in the lobby. I know their stories. I know some of their stories. And I'm burdened that every one of them would have a sponsor family here for $30 a month. $30 a month. 
Every week I spend time in our children's and student ministries and it touches my heart deeply and reminds me of the commitments that we make every time we baptize one of those little babies and we commit as a church body to be the village that comes around that family and raises them. Hear this. Impacting others will always impact you. In that spirit, I want to invite Chase and Rachel Higginbotham to the platform this morning. As Chase and Rachel come, let me just remind you at the close of service today, all athletes from Pinson Valley, we're going to have you stand up here again and let the family here come alongside of and love on y'all as we prepare to close. The band comes on that. Uh, it's been a, an emotional week with Chase and Rachel. We've been in conversations with the students last Sunday, with the adult leaders a week ago, last Saturday, and, and then with the staff a week ago this last Thursday. And, and we're so grateful for the mighty impact that Chase is our youth minister uh, for the last eight years, a part of our youth ministry staff almost this January will be. Um, and Chase has a real special announcement to share with our body. Thanks, brother. Yeah, so it's uh, Rachel and I, for clear for us, Clear Branch has been a, a special place. Uh, I came here uh, when I was 11 in fifth grade, back in like 98 or so, when it was a church plant, meeting over at Clay Chalkwell Middle School. Um, and Rachel, for her, the fifth grade for her was like early 2000s. I'm a little bit older than her. Uh, and so we, we, we grew up in this church. We were a part of this youth ministry. Uh, we went on all the trips, did all of that. I went off to college. I went to Alabama. And I did know, uh, like, who Jesus was in terms of just, like, I knew some facts about him, but I never had a relationship with Jesus. And so I went off to Alabama uh, and thought I wanted to be a broadcast meteorologist. I was going to be a weather guy on TV. And uh, after college, uh, actually throughout college, there was this guy named Jeff that shared the gospel with me and showed me who Jesus was in a way that I really never knew. Uh, and so after college, uh, I thought, again, that I was going to go off and be on television and I got saved. I ended up basically hitting what I would describe as my rock bottom, and I'm just kind of sparing you some details. Some of you know my story. Uh, and so after that, I moved back home and kind of still thought that I may go into uh, doing uh, meteorology, and God started to stir my heart uh, and burden my heart for, he was changing my desires. I mean, I again, growing up, I thought I needed to like be a better person so that God would love me, and I thought he would love a future version of me. And for the first time in my life, I realized uh, that God had proved his love for me in full at the cross. And he didn't love a future version of me. He loved me as much as he's ever going to love me now. And he proved it through Jesus. And so I was changing. He was changing my desires. I longed for the word. I longed for Christian community. Of course, I met Rachel in a, a small group here at Clear Branch. And during that season in 2011, early 2011, God began to draw my heart and began to call me to ministry. And so I answered that call to ministry. I came on staff here in early uh, 2012. And I've been here ever since. I mean, I was a year into my new faith and knew a few Bible verses, had preached like one sermon and was really just sharing my testimony. And God has just continued to burden our hearts for discipleship. Uh, and we've been sharing this with the students uh, and the adult leaders over the last week or so since we've shared this news. And, but we have always, Rachel and I, desired to lay our yeses of obedience on the table. And they've heard me say this before this, and I'm saying it now. But we always want to lay our yeses of obedience on the table and let God put our yeses on the map. And so that's what we've done. And God has uh, opened up a door and an opportunity to be the pastor. I'm going to be the pastor of students and discipleship at a church plant in Aniana. It's about a four-year-old church called Redeemer Community Church. It's in downtown Aniana. And we can't wait to get started there. We want to make disciples who make disciples, even as Vaughn shared this morning, the final words of Jesus to go make disciples of all nations. We want to make his final words our first word. And so we're heading to Aniana. Uh, our last Sunday will be next Sunday. Um, and it's been an emotional roller coaster because we're super excited about this new opportunity to serve in Blount County and in, 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 in Aniana. Uh, but we obviously uh, love so many of you in this room and we thank you for all the support you've shown us, all the love you've shown us over all these years. Um, and we'll be praying for you in this transition, but we're excited uh, to get started in Blount County. So you would show your love to Chase and Rachel. I couldn't love them more if they were my own, and I know they belong to others in the room here. But um, we're so proud of y'all and grateful for y'all. We're going to pray over them this next Sunday. I'm going to save that prayer because I don't know if I can handle it right now. So thank y'all as you um, yep. grab your seats there. Let me just say um, a 
couple things you need to hear related to that. One is we're so, we love Chase and Rachel. Next, if you want to make a gift as a part of the sending away gift that we'll give to them next Sunday, you can write, make the check out to Clear Branch, put in the four Chase and Rachel uh, celebration. And uh, there are so many ways that God has used them in our family, frankly, in my family, with our son and our daughter, uh, that we are forever indebted to. We've begun the process of looking for the right person to build on the foundation that Chase and Rachel have laid in our student ministry here. I'm thrilled to share with you today that in addition to everything else he does um, with our cross haven service, with our young adult ministry, with our, our small groups, with all those other uh, hats that he wears and plates that he spins, the interim youth pastor in our student ministry will be none other than Jeremy Awful, who's been a youth minister for a while. Do you want to give thanks to God for that too? <laughs> Would you stand and let me share a prayer over you? Let's pray. Lord, we do ask that you would bless Chase and Rachel as they step out into the great unknown to love you more faithfully and to follow you more courageously. We ask you to bless them and us in our commitment to love you selflessly and with all that we have and all that we are. We thank you that their yes was long ago placed on the table and that you have placed it here with us for the last eight years. We also trust you to lead them in this new season of ministry and lead us to the right person to build on this incredible foundation that's been laid. And God, I ask you specifically that you would forgive us for the times that we have loved you half-heartedly, for the times that we have loved you with our leftovers instead of our first fruits. Help us to always remember that loving you will best be best seen in loving others. And help us to remember that loving others will lead us to ministry right here at home. It'll lead us to, to ministry right here in this community. It'll lead us into ministry all around this great country in which you've placed us. But it will also lead us to the ends of the earth. Jesus, you told us to be your witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth forgive us when we've only wanted to follow partially. Loving you will involve engaging in worship more faithfully. Loving you will involve being equipped as constantly learning and growing as your disciples. And loving you will mean being employed in ministry and mission till all the world hears your name and every knee bows and every tongue confesses that you are indeed the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Help us to be a church of people who have a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. And we pray this prayer in the name of the one who left heaven to come to be with us. So that when, this, that when we leave earth, we can go and be with him forever. We pray it in the name of all names. The name of Jesus, God's people would say, amen. And amen. I'm going to invite the athletes to come on down here. As they're making their way, let me just remind you today, you can go to clearbranch.org forward slash yes to sign up for ministry. You can also stop by all the tables and Missions Corner. We want to invite you after you've greeted the athletes here. Keep coming, guys. Spread on out. Uh, and after you've greeted the athletes here to go out, find your place to serve in mission and ministry with us. And God bless you as you go do it.